Good afternoon. Well, it may have been appropriate for one of my colleagues from the Oxford region to be here to talk about Great Western Park. But nonetheless, we're here from uh, the middle of the, the country in Leicester to share the uh, Grangewood Manor scheme. A penguin walks into a bar and says to the barman, have you seen my brother? Barman replies, what's he look like? Think about it. <laughs> you know, even with uh, Peter's example earlier of the sheep, you know, we go round and we see uh, these things, but we don't always recognise what we're looking at. Many of us wouldn't know the breeds of sheep. And uh, like um, we've already mentioned earlier that... Um, Obviously, a number of us are doing the same thing. But maybe we're not talking, and this is a great environment for us to talk a bit more, isn't it? Um, you know, Great Western uh, Park there is a, a, a massive development Taylor Wimps is involved with, and clearly we are in a different part of the country, and even we're not talking to our colleagues about what they're experiencing, so we've got some lessons even from this presentation. In our contents, we're just going to introduce Taylor Wimpy, who we are, the site background and information to this particular site, the drivers for the SUDS, design criteria, design process and relationship, the journey that we've had, construction commercial feedback, public engagement, our lessons learned, tail of Wimpy, are we SUDS or are we DUDS? Of course, we're one of the largest residential developers in the UK, and most of you, um, I, I can see there's a number of uh, authorities here, and you will have dealt with us in some shape or form, I'm sure, and a number of the consultants as well. And I recognise a number of faces amongst you, and certainly some of the names. We build over 10,000 homes, clearly most of them are at Great Western Park. <laughs> Each year, ranging from one bedroom apartments to six bedroom homes, and having 24 regional offices. We're a responsible home builder, and health and safety is our non-negotiable top priority. And the thing is, through all this, through all the design, through all the uh, planning, through all of the um, illustrative layouts, at the end of the day, we have to deliver it. We've got guys on site with their machines putting this stuff in. We're a public limited company. We're listed in the FTSE 250. We're just about to go up to the FTSE 100 again. Our vision is to create value, deliver quality, becoming the UK's leading residential developer. And we actually do much more than build homes. We do a lot of community engagement. We strike partnerships with stakeholders. We bring places to life, breathing investment into communities. And we develop sustainable communities, not only from a SUDS point of view, but socially and economically. But a lot of the development money goes in, as you know, through the Section 106 and through the, uh, the gain of the planning into the community. So here we are back at Grangewood, Grangewood Manor. There's a, a 9.85 hectare site located in rural Leicestershire, as Jake's already mentioned. It was originally promoted by our strategic land team. So the site as a, a, as a land package will have been dealt with over a number of years, probably eight to 10 years. Initial strike up with a, probably, I think in this case was a, a, a farmer, a couple of land hold, stakeholders, and then we promoted the site um, to, to bring an outline planning commission in July 2012. We then went for the reserve matters for 145 homes and the site was supported by a design and access statement originally done by the consulting team through the promotion and a master plan and then we achieved the reserve matters in March 2013. So it's not your traditional week 13 week process as you can see from an outline to reserve matters. The site background information, so you can see that the site is uh, predominantly on the edge of um, the, the edge of sort of development here, so it's sort of an urban, an urban sort of um, expansion into into a greenfield area. Drivers for the suds here. So the outline consent required a sustainable approach to drainage. The water authority, which is Seven Trent Water, was policy is not to adopt any balancing facility or to allow a private management company to maintain the features. So unless the authorities were to adopt the uh, balancing lagoon and the features, we were stuck because we got nowhere to turn with our future adoptions. And I know that we're often called monsters for it, but we do like to be able to create a development that has got an adoption and a sustainable approach. It's got to be maintainable in perpetuity. And as developers, we can't hang around for years, we've got to be able to build, create a new um, community, and then hand that on to be maintained. 
So no Section 104 approval was available to us here and no future adoption under the traditional approach. That needed us to get to grips with the Flood Water Management Act and to put Taylor Wimpy at the forefront of SUDS in this particular area, on this particular scheme. So we were driven to it. And we were also very fortunate that we had an authority. We were also at the forefront and looking to partner with a stakeholder to bring these designs into, um, in, into Leicestershire. So we entered into negotiations with Jake and his team at the Leicestershire uh, County Council as the future SAB partnership. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, our senior engineer, Steve. He's going to just run through the design criteria with you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Chris. Good afternoon. OK, so the design criteria. The discharge rate was restricted to greenfield runoff, which was 14.9 litres per second, and this was as per the approved FRA. We had a positive outfall to an existing ditch on site. There was a water course that spanned the bottom of the site that we drained to. Flood protection for a 100-year plus 30% climate change of critical storm duration. We want to offer as much drainage as possible for adoption. No infiltration. We carried out site investigation um, works as part of the ground investigation report. Came back, soakways were not going to be a viable option on this development. And we wanted the design to be in the image of the Flood and Water Management Act and the national standards. So the journey. Produce a blobby plan. It's not Mr Blobby's plan for world domination. Off he blobs. It's actually a conceptual drainage design um, that we did before the planning layout was produced. We wanted to design our features before anybody got their hands on it, before any houses were plonked on. We wanted to show where these features needed to go and size correctly. This conceptual drainage design um, was produced and tabled at a meeting with LCC um, to agree an in-principle drainage and adoption strategy. The drainage design was developed to fully inform the proposed planning layout and a second meeting was held with LCC to confirm the proposals were acceptable subject to detail. Now this gave us real comfort before we submitted our reserve matters application. I really like this slide. It's, um, it shows the engagement um, with LCC. We've got the project architect, highways officer, SAB officer, consultant, engineer and most importantly some biscuits. I recommend these. Um, can anybody spot who's missing? It's not Mr Blobby before you said <laughs> It was Jake. Yeah. Um, Jake, he's been in all the other meetings and I think Jake was away this day, but he was part of the team, obviously. I'm sure. <laughs> I doubt it. Okay, um, so the design process and the relationships. Um, what did we look at? What did we want to do? The Suds management train. Um, this was the first thing that we turned to. Prevention, source control, site control, regional control, okay? And we thought that would lead to a future SAB consent. Right. With the SUDS management train in place, we looked at preventative measures, so we reduced drained areas wherever possible. I know that sounds really simple, but we, we didn't put roads in for the sake of putting roads in. We screwed back permeable, um, sorry, um, private drives so that we didn't increase volume or runoff. We were really diligent with our design. Source control, we incorporated permeable paving. Now these were wrapped um, into um, minor roads, private drives, so lightly traffic roads, cul de sac type streets. Site control, we incorporated conveyance swales, filter drains, and regional control, we incorporated its tension basin at the bottom of the site with a restricted flow rate back to our 14.9 litres per second. And we believe that allowed us to tick the quality, quantity, amenity and biodiversity um, box, which allowed LCC to adopt all future water, surface water drainage features. This is a, a slide um, it's, it's of the site and it shows the different areas, so purple, our source control, so these are our permeable areas, green, conveyance swales, um, and blue is site control. Looking at the scheme in relation to the national standards, um, could we discharge to the ground first and foremost? No. Second best surface water body? Yes. Tick. We had a water course on the site. 
SAB adoption, um, more than one property. Well, LCC agreed to take over the surface water features, so yes, tick. Did we address quality, quantity and amenity in equal measures? Well, we believe we did. Was, um, did we manage uh, runoff managed at source and surface? Well, we incorporated permeable paving, swales, ponds, so yes, we would say that we did. The design, um, it included a 30% allowance for climate change. In a 100-year event, we only passed the equivalent greenfield runoff rates and no flooding in a 30, controlled flooding in a 100. Well, we actually had no flooding in a 100 of critical duration. And was it cost-effective? The big question, which Chris will come on to later. So to compare the SUDS-based scheme to if we'd have gone for a traditional-based scheme, just to give you an idea of some of the numbers, for a 30-year event, we thought that we would need 1,400 cube of storage, and that would be um, incorporated in 800 linear metres of 1,500 diameter pipe. Now, that's a lot of storage. To cater for the 100 year, plus 30%, so the exceedance storage, we needed 950 cube. That's on top of the original storage. And as Chris has alluded to, we didn't have anybody to take this on. Okay? Looking at the traditional versus the SUDS approach again, on the left-hand side, if we had have gone down the traditional route, yes, we would have addressed quantity. We've got lots of pipes under the road. We could put lots of drainage in there. But did we address qu um, quality and amenity and biodiversity? Mm. On the right-hand side, the SUDS method that we, um, that we employed, we feel we addressed quality, quantity, amenity and biodiversity in equal measures. Tick. This is a snippet of the site again. Roads, traditionally adopted by Leicestershire County Council. Swales, now adopted by Leicestershire County Council. And a pond, nobody wanted to take them, now adopted by Leicestershire County Council. I've sort of, um, for the construction and commercial feedback element, um, I've pasted in uh, the original design of the swales and then a shot of what it looked like on the ground. Um, not to go over what Jake's already said, but he's absolutely right. We feel like we lost a bit of developable space there. And next time, at that previous mug shot of everybody sat around the table, we'll make sure the archaeological team, archaeological, ecological team, <laughs> are involved in the process so that we can just squeeze those swales over. And then permeable paving, three amigos. Lesson learned for Taylor Wimpy factor in a little bit more time. When you're putting these features in, it's not your standard build programme, add a little bit extra. Now then, traditional versus suds, the money side of things. I'm going to hand you back over to Chris. Thank you very much for listening. So as developers, when we're looking at cost, we tend to look at a standard site and then we'll take what we call abnormals over and above the, uh, the standard calculations. So for a standard site, we might be looking at a, uh, a, a just a 100 millimetre, say, pipes underground, and then anything that's over that. So if we went into Steve's traditional storage system, then we would look at the extra over cost for putting in that storage, and that would be the abnormal for the site. Um, so from what we class as a clean land value to... Uh, um, a dirty land value, if you like, when you take off the abnormals, you then get to a residual land value. So the traditional extra over build cost for all that storage that Steve mentioned there is just shy of half a million pounds here. So if you were playing the Bruce's higher lower game, who thinks that the, the SUDS system would cost us more? No show of hands. So you're going to go for slightly less, or we're not responding at all. <laughs> well, in fact, the build cost extra over for the uh, SUD system on this particular site is just shy of £400,000. So we are showing a saving to the traditional storage system that Steve mentioned here. This is on the physical build. So you could say, well, what about the land take? What about the, um, what about the actual commuted sums? Well, the commuted sums also on this particular site, when calculated with the authority, were still... Um, equivalent or less than what it would have cost us with a management company to take on uh, the, the, the ponds. Um, and with the land take on this particular site, because we had a larger land area and a restricted number of dwellings, we had the space to put it in. 
So if you like, it sort of ticks some of the development boxes for the commercialities. So to sales features. So can as developers sell these, uh, these features that we're, we're putting in? Well, the answer is yes, we are. And in our sales um, area, and you've all been to a new sales home area, I'm sure, to have a look at the designs in there. We've actually got two boards which are actually representing the story of SUDS and the mechanisms by what's happening on this particular site. And we're actually finding that people are going in and they're reading this and they're asking questions about it. The general public today want to know about the engineering of their site and they want to know what's happening with the water on their new build site because they don't want to be blamed for something that's happening downstream like what you mentioned in uh, Oxfordshire on the Thames. Future ideas, we've even thought about putting um, plaques around the actual features, making them into sort of wildlife and um, adventure sort of areas to play around, stating to people what the feature is, what it does, what it's here to do, even encouraging school visits to come and have a look and say, well, this particular feature that you see here is also dealing with the water from the homes, it's dealing with the water from the parking areas and it's dealing with the water from the roads. Lessons learned. Pre-planning. Surface water features to be identified as very soon as possible. Now it would seem that right from the chairman's remarks, uh, as, as I've been listening, so chairman, um, chairman's remarks, Peter, Barry, Chris, Jake, Steve and now I, we're all saying get in early. And that's the key to it, isn't it? That if these features are not designed in and considered by the consultants and considered by the authorities at an early stage, it almost becomes too late to try and fit them in later. So the whole thing has got to be dealt with right back at the concept stage, right back when those early negotiations are happening with the planning authorities, right back when you as consultants are writing the, uh, the, the, the flood, um, the, the, flood the, the risk assessments um, and you're writing the um, design and access statements for the site, as already alluded to. Upfront dialogue with what we're calling the blobby plans. So they're not constraints, they're design features. We're actually laying onto the land where you're actually going to put these areas of conveyance very early on so that when the architects can go in and design from an urban point of view with their um, 12 steps to li living and in, in, in housing, they can put in there and work around the features that make it work for the site themselves. It's obvious, you would think, but these design parameters aren't being put in early and it does become an issue and I'm sure that we've all seen that as we've gone along. And construction, allow additional time to construct the features. It's not just a technical buy-in, it's a whole holistic approach right from concept right to purchases and even then adoption and then life cycle and then in perpetuity as things go forward. Taylor Wimpy, well are we suds or are we duds? So there's Leicestershire and a little bit of Lincolnshire there and you can see that we're showing eight new developments that we're looking at right now. They're all secured, they're all land that's in for planning at the moment and they're all starting this year or next year and they're all designed with the same parameters. We've been through the blobby plan stage, we've talked with Jake, we've talked about putting these, uh, these features in, we're incorporating the lessons learned, we're looking at using the lagoons for more amenity as well as the feature that they are themselves. We've learned some of the lessons that Barry's stated with curbs and runoff and um, in, in the, the dock that's just outside here in, in, uh, in Lincolnshire. We're also starting to negotiate with Lincolnshire as well, um, introducing permeable paving, runoff into swales. Is Warren here? I think his name is Dan, he's not, not made it today. But, um, and we're, we're talking through the blobby plan stage exactly like we did with Jake to take this not just into Leicestershire but into Lincolnshire as well. Here's some statements from our board of uh, directors. So, Dominic is our managing director, and Dominic saying, well, we seek to work with our stakeholders, of course we do, and we work with the communities <coughs> to build our homes. We've been designing SUDs for a number of years, but we've not always done it in this holistic way, 
and we've not done it in such a way where the suds have taken the house drainage as well. That's always gone into the traditional section 104. Whereas these sites that we've talked about have excluded the traditional 104 approach totally and gone with um, you know, you know, the new, the new uh, SAB features. It's a holistic approach. And um, we see the adoption of a place making a feature and it's be a practical solution to what, uh, you know, what's there. And of course our managing director is delighted that we're being used to, uh, to take this process forward. Our land director was initially concerned at the cost of suds on the development and his, costs, and his concerns were eased when um, you know, the costs were produced. He was also concerned about the land take, the, the amount of land that the swales would take away from net developable area for us. Um, but again, he was uh, eased on this particular site because we had more land available. He's also looking forward to the introduction of the Flood Water Management Act to provide a level playing field across all of the developers alike. As you'll appreciate when we're bidding for land, we like to do it on a level playing field. The commercial director was also encouraged because at first he was concerned that this would be building in cost and it would have a negative impact on the business and future land purchases. But after he, after he tendered it and he'd seen that the traditional system um, was with the deep oversized pipes that were more expensive, he could see that savings could be made rather than costs. So that sort of perked him up and encouraged him to buy into the scheme as well. So in summary, he believes SUDS will enhance our sites and maintain our cost base, hence the eight more sites that we're taking forward on this particular system. Our production director is saying is he, they're after clear routes for future adoption of the sites and for planning, and he liked the holistic design approach that he saw so that he could get this programming in and he could deliver the business aspirations. Clearly, we have numbers that we like to produce by the end of the year, for our customers. It's also, and we alluded to it earlier, from a safety point of view, that the deep excavations from the traditional storage had been designed out in the SUDS approach, making the work environment safer. We shouldn't miss this point. You know, I've seen sites where there's you know, excavations of eight to 10 meters to get storage in, and you know, with trench collapse and all the boxing and everything that goes into it, you know, it's, it's not a safe environment creating shallow suds features, it's you know, a, a technology that is, is, is safe for our workforce out there and that's important. Our sales and marketing, marketing director, of course sales and marketing directors will always put spin on things, and um, you know, but genuinely the Grangewood Manor has been enhanced because it's providing these lush green areas and instant curb appeal and interest. You can see from the pictures that it looked look nice. Customers are fascinated to learn that the lagoons and swales and drainage solutions, they love the areas of open space. Why wouldn't you? It's places to walk your dogs, places for the children to play. You don't feel cramped. And indeed, we've got customers who are waiting for the, uh, um, the homes that are going to be released around the features. Um, they're waiting for those homes to be released so that they can purchase them and have that outlook. And I suppose it also protects the future of the outlook of that home because it's a feature that can't be developed on. Food for thought, just as we, as we summarise up. Now, I, I know you've got, to take, you've got to bear with me a bit here, but based on the 10,000 homes that Taylor, Taylor Wimpy aimed to build this year, if, if three quarters of them are on Greenfield and require attenuation, that would roughly be about 315 thousand cubic meters of storage. That's equivalent to 8,529 Routemaster double-decker buses of new storage in the UK this year from just one major developer. That's approximately three quarters of the size of the O2 Arena, I'm being told, for those of you who live around here. <laughs> so that's a major, major amount of storage just going in <coughs> this year around the UK. So clearly the management of surface water and the approach to flood water management is significant. From our regional perspective, we welcome and encourage developing partnerships with the SAB. And we would ask that this positive engagement is embraced by consultants, developers and authorities alike. Because that's where it is. it's in this holistic buy-in 
It's not just us, it's not just the authorities, not just the consultants. It's even involving the customers and the long-term longevity and the, uh, you know, the adoption of the sites in perpetuity. I hope that's been helpful, so thank you for your time.